education. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another gracious day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity uh, as we begin to end this year. I pray for our seniors as they begin to transition to uh, school, the workforce, military, and any other dreams they may have that you will be with them. Uh, I pray as we, this board decides and interviews for our new CSFO that we make the right decision for the benefit of our students and our school system. These are the blessings I ask. Amen. Amen. Can you please stand for our pledge? <coughs> Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have before you the agenda for today. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Agenda has been passed. Next on our agenda, recognition please. Dr. Dot. Yes, sir. Ah, the first group up today, we have some students from Spain Park High School that are here to present a big check to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So our students from Spain Park High School. Please come forward. This is from our Health Science Academy at Spain Park High School. And Maggie Roundtree from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Please, please. Good evening. I, am, I just want to take just one second to um, share with you, just so you know a little bit more about the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So we are the largest voluntary health organization committed to achieving three things. First and foremost, finding a cure for blood cancers, which of course include um, Secondly, funding the best of the best, um, cutting edge research. Um, in fact, we actually have three world renowned researchers at UAB right now working to find a cure, and that's made possible by schools just like St. Park. And then three, ensuring that all blood cancer patients um, receive access to those treatments. So, what's really exciting is that St. Park came together again in that mission to find a cure for blood cancer and raise those funds to do so around one of their very own, um, Miss Naomi Pitts, who is a lymphoma survivor and a junior at Spain Park High School. So it is with great pride that we can partner with Mr. Zajac, um, host the students, and of course Naomi, and making that possible. So Very good. Ask if Jane Grosser to come down so he can get the picture for you. <laughs> Murphy, uh, Stephen Presley, and also Craig Kelby. Happy to know Miss Pitts uh, is planning to attend all the university university as he, after he graduates from high school. Glory, glory, glory. Moving on. <laughs> United States Senate page by Jeff Sessions this year. Only 30 students per session are given this honor across the country, so we're very proud of Grace, and those she's going to represent our community and Spain Park High School well at the United States Senate. Um, next up is all this fancy um, stuff we have coming here. So Janet Orr, environmental science teacher at Spain Park High School, will tell you about our it's Hoover High School. It's like Spain Park. <laughs> about an amazing science student. Well, these are two of my students, and we have we have practiced this, and we practice it in different formats. But you know, sometimes it doesn't work. So this is Rowan and uh, Roseanne El Kashawi, and they are at the Intel Science Fair, International Science and Engineering Fair. They're one of eight gr uh, groups from the state of Alabama, and they worked on their um, a, pro a, a protocol where they've extracted like blood from ladybugs. And it works as an antibiotic and as a, as a potential as a pesticide to work on citrus blight. And so they're being recognized. Wait, girls. 
And this is a this is a peer dive. <laughs> there we go. It's okay. Let's just wait. Just wait. There we go. Uh, smile. <laughs> We have great high hopes. It has some um, some um, commercial possibilities, and they they're doing really well. You can see their <laughs> stuff behind them. They're excited. There are only 52 people in their category, so we have great high hopes. There are about 2,000 people um, from all over the world that are there, and they've already won a fair amount of scholarship money. And the Roseanne um, is the one on the right, and she's a sophomore, and uh, Roman's a senior at Hubei. We're excited, and uh, I'm headed out there for Wednesday, so yes. <laughs>
understanding is the difference in su supplanting and, and, and supplementing funds as it relates to your federal funding? Supplanting basically means to in place of or to replace with. Um, and of course, you can't do that with federal funds. If you already came with something with, say, your general fund, you can't just replace those funds with federal funds. With federal funds. Supplement is to add to, and that's what your, the purpose of your federal programs are, is to add to Ms. Hancock, communication uh, is so, so important in everything that we do. Um, what, what is your way of communicating not only with the people in your department, but with the administrators and teachers and those of us on the board? Uh, what's your communication process and style of, of relaying information, maybe not in ways to, just you understand, but in ways that we could understand it? teachers as well because they don't always know what that one month reserve is and why you have to have that. Um, some other things that I like to do is each month as I do the monthly financials, I like to send all the board members and the superintendent um, an email with a copy of the financials that, that they have in their email. Um, we actually put them in the drop in a drop box as well, but I send that ahead of time just explaining and giving an overview of any financial transactions that may have happened during the, the month that may be unusual or large transactions. Any capital outlay, we have a lot of capital outlay just because we have old buildings, but um, they're usually interested in that. Um, as far as to teachers, um, one thing that I have found just being a, a teacher myself that I didn't realize until 
until I came into this position, is that you, you see the financials and it looks like you have all this money, but most of that money is actually restricted funds. And so I would try to explain that those are, you know, what is restricted for federal programs and, you know, your special ed programs and everything, that that is restricted. And also at the local school level, you have public and non-public funds. And, you know, there, different, there are different, you know, rules and laws that you have to follow in, as to what you can do with those. So that's something, you know, not a lot of teachers understand. So I would relay that as well. Thank you. Now, as you know, uh, Hoover is going through some challenges with uh, budgets and uh, deficits. So, I think everyone is. <laughs> like everyone is. Uh, and, and we're, we're saying that uh, every year uh, prior to September, I'm sure you're getting with the principals and, and the leadership to talk about uh, what things can uh, go or what things have, have to stay. Give me some examples of, uh, of when that has occurred in, in your position, and how, how did you handle uh, as far as cuts? Cuts. Yes. Actually, we just did that last week. Uh -huh. um, basically, what we did was I um, uh, worked with the superintendent, and we got all the directors together and tried to look at the units, you know, the foundation units. We don't have a lot of excess money, so we don't have a lot of local units. I know y'all have a lot of local units. But you Right, that you can do that, but we had a lot of local units that we were having to cut, and then we had our enrollment has dropped as well. So we had to cut. We we looked at things where we could actually transfer teachers. Um, we actually ended up losing five units with <coughs> the low, the foundation units and with our federal budget <coughs> as well. So we just got everybody together, and then once we kind of came up with different scenarios that the principals could actually do, we asked them to come in, bring their schedules with them. We wanted to look and be sure that all their, you know, their schedules were fully maximized for all their positions and to try to see where we could, you know, do as least cuts as possible. So collaboratively, that works along with the foot process. Does it work with the super, along with the superintendent? Yes, yes. The superintendent and myself and all the <coughs> directors met together. And then we brought in the, the principals individually. You mentioned uh, public and private funds. Um, so, for example, one of our high schools came to me, lately came to you and said, we've got $60,000 donated to girls softball backstop dugout fund. Uh, how would you deal with that challenge? How would you handle the money? What would still be in, in place as far as code and, and everything? Well, I think any donation is a, is a blessing from God. <laughs> so basically, um, I would want to sit down with the superintendent, me, program directors, the principal of that high school, the, the coaches involved in that and talk about what the expectations of that um, club, you know, have. And then we would, of course, have to, the, you know, since it's a large project, of course, we would have to go, we would get board approval, and then we would have to actually um, go through the building commission, and of course, you always have to follow the bid law. Any concerns with Title IX with that situation? Um, well, of course, there's always concerns with Title IX. Um, you just have to be sure that every, everyone is accommodated and it's equal representation. <coughs> Several years ago, uh, here in Jefferson County, uh, we were uh, allowed, uh, the voters agreed to a, a one cent sales tax. Um, one of our commissioners at that time allowed that uh, money to be paid up front in a one-time one uh, payment that uh, would uh, last the life, the 20 year life of that one cent sales tax. Um, so we have some monies that we have set aside that allow us to dip into as, uh, as a deficit budget each year. Uh, however, we have, uh, for the past several years, uh, dipped into that more than that allotted amount. What, uh, what's your thought process uh, on presenting a deficit budget to the board? Um, I wouldn't want to present a deficit budget per se, but you can tap into your uh, equity or your fund balance, but um, you, know, you actually can't even, you have to budget with a one month reserve. So, you know, you have down payments just as you would in business so you know that's going to happen throughout the years but I would say that I would still no matter what I would want to present a budget that at least met a one month reserve the, the board is responsible for approving a budget every single year and uh, uh, many board members are not accountants especially in the education realm. Okay. Uh, so how would you explain information to the board how do you do it currently? Is it 
you, uh, your budget hearing uh, in September that occurred a month ahead of time. time. How would you explain those expenditure, expenditure pieces to the board? I usually break them down by different programs and then I try to break them down on what will be listed on your financials as far as construction, um, operations, um, transportation, <coughs> and your auxiliary um, departments as well. And I just try to break it down and kind of give an overall total of what total expenditures are budgeted in that. Um, but yes, we do two budget hearings. We're all required to do two budget hearings per year. Um, I prefer to do those in August. Um, we have had that happen where we're almost at the end of August before we do those, but I prefer to do those in August to, because once you do the first budget hearing, you're ready to think that come up before the second, you make sure you make some changes as well. Um, it's always last minute changes before you uh, submit that budget. Um, as far as communicating anything financially, um, again, I like to send out an email monthly to um, board members, to all board members, to let them know any, any major changes or you know, even an overview of what the uh, average oil taxes are that we collected for that month. Do you normally give a weekly update within uh, the board meetings? I mean, monthly update within the board meetings or just strictly through an email? Uh, we don't do it at the board meetings just to save time, but I mean, I have been in court passes present different things at board meetings, of course, and a lot through work, work sessions that we have as well. Um, but I just try to do it in an email and then uh, I try to do that at least. That was something when I came on board with Bacon, then getting the financial the day of the board meeting. Current structure is where you are, but do you collaborate at all, or at least reach out to city government? We do actually. We have some money called TVA and Lula. TVA owns a lot of properties in our area, and so we meet with those officials actually quite often. That money is slowly disappearing, so we've been having actually a lot of um, meetings on what we're going to do, what we're all going to do um, when that money disappears. So yeah, we meet with. wrote a note here to Mr. Kelly and I, the, the one question I always have asked is just why Hoover and I believe he said that was the answer, but. Well, not Hoover. <laughs> That's great, <laughs> right. I like that. That's <laughs> good answer. Hoover is one of the most recognized and most respected systems in the state. Um, anything I've ever read about Hoover or seen, you even had a TV show for your football team so that I used to watch, so, um, you know, for me, there was that. Um, so it, it, you know, it's a great opportunity for me to grow as a professional. Um, there's such a standard of success that I see in all your different programs. You have a lot of nationally board certified teachers, which speaks. I know I took a class from one of your teachers at Bumpus Middle School when I was pursuing my national board certification. Um, my daughter even took ACT courses at um, Spain Park. So, you know, it's a standard of success here, and I'd like to be a part of that. Thank you. You mentioned the um, bad word and one taxes. Um, <laughs> we've got um, all county state. We've got a renewal coming up at some point. What's your thoughts about when you would ask your governing agency to call the election? Do you think calling the general election is good? Do you think it's it's best to call in a, in a more targeted environment? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's good to call. I think it's good to call the What's your uh, your opinion on employee or teacher supplements? Um, as far as like for extra duties that they can have. Um, well, being the wife of a head basketball coach for several years, um, I know the stress and the time that's involved with coaches, and I know you know what they do. Um, you know, it, it's actually just another 
full-time job as well, and I believe that they should be compensated. I know what I do in Jackson County is we actually have that as part of our salary schedule based upon the score. Some of our secondary sports are not do not receive as much of a supplement, um, and of course football is always our largest, but um, that's included in our salary schedule, and then I budget it. I, I think it's important to get that in the budget so you know in advance that that money is, is needs to be set aside. Tell me the, the collaborative relationship between the superintendent and CF, CFO is uh, kind of interesting because the board hires the CSFO, and, but day-to-day -day operations come through the superintendent. With that being said, uh, how have you in the past uh, given information to the board when you may have disagreed strongly with your superintendent? of the board that it is important to keep them informed. I mean, you have to vote and you have to make decisions. Um, this, you know, based, even though it's based upon the superintendent's recommendation, you still have to just make those decisions. So when, when, when asked, I'm always uh, welcome to give that information, but I always felt like the superintendent should know as well. So I would always tell him, you know, I give this information or it's been asked for and I've, I've relayed this information as well. So I think you need to keep those lines of communication open and just be transparent. In, in the event where uh, situations occur where uh, <coughs> five or seven or more may not know uh, a particular, uh, when something is going wrong, mm -hmm. so they may not ask per se. Right. So in that same instance, when you see that things may not be correct or right, at what point uh, do you present that to the board? Um, I usually, um, we've, we've actually had some Expand on this a little bit. If, um, say, the superintendent came to you, gave you uh, an Excel report, or a data report, um, some information, and she asked you or made the comment that this is information I need to stay before you and I, and you and the superintendent. Mm -hmm. But then I came and asked you the same information. How would you handle that conflict? Well, again, I work for the board, and anything that is financially related is my responsibility. So give it to you as well as everyone else because that's fair but I'll also let her know that I had relayed that information. My last question uh, Mr. Murphy. Um, Ms. Hancock, Jackson County has 6,500 students, is that right? Roughly? Uh, yeah, roughly more like about 6,000. Okay, 6,000 students in a $60 million budget? 40. $40 million budget? What's your feeling about coming to a system that has 10,000 more students and $100 million more in a budget? An opportunity. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, basically, I mean, even though you have a big, a much bigger budget, I know you have a lot more local units, which is, again, I said that's such an asset that you have. Um, you know, you're still working through the same processes, you know, no matter what the budget is, there's still the same rules that you have to apply, still the same laws that you have to follow. As a CIS, CISFO, give me an example of a challenging or a tough decision, uh, the most tough decision that you make in your position. Um, one of the things that I encountered when I came to Jackson County is, again, we're a poor system uh, compared to especially Hoover and larger, larger systems. Um, and my background was in technology. So when I came, everybody had, basically the finance department was just doing things because they'd always done them this way. A lot of our staff, over 20 years experience and this is just how they always did everything. So it's been a slow process to bring technology into them and change some processes. Um, I found that the best way to do that is only implement one thing at a time and let them kind of get used to it before we 
implement something that we're currently rolling out, soft docs. I'm not sure if y'all use soft docs or not. Um, that's just a little more paperless environment. Um, I started the purchasing card, which has been a, a, it was quite a shock to our accounts payable. He has 43 years in accounts payable in that actual position, but she's gotten used to it and it's worked out well. Now, uh, you know, they're, they've slowly come on board through the years that I've been there, and they're now more willing to share ideas, and they, they have a lot of great ideas to have about how we can change things now. So that was that was the first challenge. Thank you. Uh, on some of the software you use, what do y'all use on, on your time to for example, Chronos? How do you track that? We don't currently have a time in attendance. Actually, I just we were at our ASBO conference last week, and I talked with Chronos. They are basically the leader in time and attendance. Um, I've looked at prices and research prices for um, Jackson County, and they're, li they're slightly more expensive, but when I look at what they offer, I sit through some demos. ASBO has taught some classes on, um, or had some uh, systems that actually use Chronos to lead those classes. So I've kind of been a little bit, you know, with any time and attendance, or with any, just like what we're doing at Soft Talks, most of your work is on the front end, but once you get all that in place, it's just a matter of getting people used to it, and but it's just the, the biggest issues are usually on the front end of getting everything implemented, and it takes a lot of time to do that. But um, it, it, what I've looked with Chronos again, it's, it's top of the line. It's one of the best out there, and it has a lot more features than a lot of other time and attendance systems do. Um, have you been a teacher? It's easy to look at a budget and say, let's take away X, but with every action, there's reaction. So in saying that, how will you be able to go through that? I'll give an example of going through our deficit, looking at Timmy and all these things, like we can cut it down to X hundred dollars, but how do you evaluate the effect of that? How would you advocate for uh, things that may not need to come out? Well, again, being a classroom teacher, I'm always with that process and um, again just dealing with staff and last week you don't want to tell somebody that they're about to lose their job or you know they're going to have to be transferred to pursuing their skills so again I think you need to look at the overall picture look at different funding sources such as you know, other state programs um, federal programs see what you can uh, do there um, um, they're all um, you know, there are other cuts that you can make but of course since your personnel is 90% of your budget that's usually has the biggest impact right off the bat but there you know there's some smaller changes that you can make as well um, you can uh, renegotiate debt um, there um, I know we've done that in the past but you know I, I would want to before I make cuts I would want as far as personnel I want to be sure that the impact on the classroom is small you know again I mentioned earlier maximizing uh, all positions against your schedule and getting in place and and that was something that we just recently did. But yes, I definitely sympathize with the teacher, and I know that what goes on in the classroom, and that's the most important thing, and that's what we're here for. So that would be, it's always hard, but sometimes that's where your cuts have to be, but again, you're trying to uh, maximize those as much as you can to get the most for your buck, as well as um, keep everything in place for those students, and give them as many opportunities as you can. Any additional questions? Academies at uh, Hoover High School and uh, and at Spain Park, Mr. G, and so those are actually located on campus okay. on those campuses. And on your transportation, um, how many buses do you own? How many routes do you own? Come in a given day. About 160. 160. 
our system we might actually have you do we're just spread out and then you do your own I mean you provide your buses you don't outsource those we don't outsource okay. thank you so much thank you thank Board uh, shall now convene to executive session. Uh, purpose of good name and character. I will expect about the 15, 20 minutes uh, for that uh, meeting. Uh, any questions? On board? I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn to executive session. Can I have a second? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. She'll be back in 15, 15 20 minutes. Thank you. convene for the discussion about the chief school finance officer. Any questions or comments from the board? Mr. Murphy, um, as we did at our last board meeting, uh, I would like to uh, allow the board uh, some time to review uh, this candidate like we have the, the first two um, and convene at a possible call board meeting uh, a little later to be able to uh, make a recommendation for that position. Any additional questions from the board? Well, I'd just like to make a comment. We're very, very fortunate to have the, the candidates we have. I mean, it's very, very humbling to uh, have some three very, very qualified candidates. So it's a tough, tough thing to discuss. Okay, Good I have choice. A, I have a motion on the table. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Motion has been carried. We have a recognition portion. Mr. G. Grossman. Okay. Thank you. Um, earlier, uh, when we called for Spain Park recognition, um, um, Gracie Friedman was not here. Uh, we the board changed in time. So we're going to recognize her now. I want to call on uh, Ms. Libby Day, who works with the social studies teacher here at Stone Park and works with our law academy to recognize and make this presentation for Gracie. Hi, um, 
everyone. I'm Libby Day. I'm the director of Spain Parks Law Academy, and I would like to recognize Grace Friedman. Um, Grace Friedman is a junior at Spain Park and one of our Law Academy students, and she has been appointed by Senator Jeff Sessions as a Senate page for the summer. She'll be working in D.C. in the Capitol building um, for all of the senators, but she's one of 30 students chosen for this honor, and she'll have a variety of responsibilities, including setting up the Senate chambers for sessions, delivering messages throughout the Capitol building. Um, it's just an incredible honor, especially this year, given the election coming up and everything. And so we just wanted to recognize Grace for all her hard work and this amazing achievement. we're doing recognitions, I would uh, like to take just a moment to acknowledge and to recognize you. I know that your family is with you, so this is probably a good time to, to let them come join you. Uh, but uh, Mr. Murphy, yes, Mr. Murphy, as you know, has served our board since 2011 and uh, through the end of May, and this is in appreciation and heartfelt thanks. Uh, that accompanies our gratitude to you, and so on behalf of the school district, I'd like to share this and uh, give you an opportunity to share your family with us. Thank you, thank you. I, I won't hold long, uh, but uh, it's been a pleasure serving on the school board. I have a, had a great, great, great time. Uh, I have one missing here. I actually forgot. I didn't learn how Friday we were going to do this, but I have one that works because I don't pay for gas money. <laughs> and uh, I tell him, don't worry about it, you good. And I wanted to make sure he didn't leave his boss uh, in a bad situation and just taking off. So that's bad teaching. Uh, but my wife, I, I, I attend pretty much everything I possibly can make it to. Uh, and folks ask me, man, well, how are you able to do these things? Uh, but uh, my wife is the best person in the world. She works, she's an attorney, and uh, she Gets the kids, we balance it out. One person take baths here and do this over there. Y'all know how it works. Uh, but I want to recognize my wife, Shanavia, uh, Alabama graduate. <laughs> right, Mr. Murphy, thank you for that. But I have uh, photographic evidence of her at Auburn game this past year. <laughs> <laughs> and my uh, middle daughter, Baylin, Tim Deer Valley, and my younger boy, three years old, Asher Robert, tends trace crossing, so I'll be here a long, long time. <laughs> but thank you all so much for the opportunity to give me this all the things that you've done for me this, this last year, so thank you so much. There is a reception this evening. I'm not sure where we're going to put that in this busy night, uh, but upstairs we will have a reception. But if I might just take one mo more additional moment of privilege. Melody Green, would you stand up? Melody is uh, retiring from our uh, school district, and uh, I'm going to grab my cheat notes, except for I don't know where they are. But <laughs> Melody, tell us how many years again in the school district? 33 years in our school district. I believe you've been in the central office now for three years as assistant superintendent. And uh, Melody, I want to acknowledge all the support that you've given me uh, as the new superintendent here. Uh, if it wasn't for Melody, I might not even have a place to live. She, she carried me pillar to post around the community. And Melody, just thank you for all the things that you've done for Hoover City Schools. We acknowledge your work and thank you. And our reception this evening is also in your, your honor, likewise. Thank you. And Kathy Antti, may I have you stand? Uh, Kathy has served as our CSFO. How many years? Again, my cheat notes well, are missing. I, I give you my whole years with Hoover City Schools, and it's 25 years. 25 <laughs> years. And so Kathy, likewise, has served uh, well in her capacity as our CSFO. 
Kathy, again, may I thank you for this last year and the support that you've given me and those umpteen questions I asked and then asked the same ones again and again. So thank you for supporting me, supporting the school district. And our reception this evening is on behalf of all three, Derek Murphy and Melody Green and also Kathy Ante. Thank you all so much. Okay, I am here after living in Hoover 27 years, having had three Auburn graduates, but three at Hoover, and I have never spoken. So tonight I'm taking the opportunity to the board and to all of you others in the audience to tell you I'm here on behalf of the Crossroads Alternative Program. I have been in then so many of the different schools subbing for years at Gwen Simmons, Hoover High, and St. Paul. But the school that has touched my life the most and made the most of the difference has been a Crossroads School. And Mr. Murphy, I want to thank you so much for coming to our graduation. But I'm here just for a minute to share this program, the beauty of this program. There are children that would have never made it through Spain Park and Hoover that have been with us. Every year at graduation, it is so heartfelt because we know that child would have been a number of statistics here in Alabama. They would have not made it through school. And because of the problems we're having in the state of Alabama with graduation rates, I want to tell you that this, this alternative program makes a difference. This is for the child that might have the IQ of 77. This might be the child that has been so terribly bullied they cannot be in a big school setting. This is for the special needs child that would have given up, that would have dropped out. We have many of our students through the years. Years ago, I used to journal. I have three journals. I have one for my 27-year-old, 29-year-old, and 31-year-old. So they know with this journal, when I leave this earth, what it meant to me to be a crossroads. Um, I want to tell you just a minute. This was from years past. I keep a lot of notes. This was from May 25, 2010. These are some of our students that graduated with us. Clay said, so very happy to be here. Ryan said, I want to stay out of trouble. Desiree said, she gave the most compelling speech, I'll never forget it, of how Crossroads changed her life. Calvin said his mom was so proud, for he was the first one of all his brothers and sisters to graduate. Matthew said he gave his rose every graduation. Our students have a rose, and they give it to somebody who's made such an impact on their life. And he gave his rose to Miss Whitney, who was then our chief and commander. Katie said she was so proud that she finally had something in her life to live for. There's no rest for her. I have three students here. They want to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit at this school years ago when we had Governor Riley, Dr. Murphy, and Mr. Murphy, I wanted to invite him to our school because I wanted him to see the difference that Crossroads made. For every, every system in Alabama needs an alternative program. If we want to see the graduation rate in this state increase, it's going to be through an alternative program. For you see, we can take children one-on-one -on -one basis we can counsel we can help that child whose life is literally falling apart now for those other principals at the Hoover schools I want to say that had there ever been an alternative school when I was in school I probably would have been because I needed it but for us today I am here fighting for the crossroads and new beginnings program and the name new beginnings just what it means. It's going to help children succeed and get to the next level. 
whether it be college, the Air Force, all the different facets, but we must continue to have an alternative program in our system. Thank you for listening. Um, I went to both base schools. I went to Stanford and Hoover, and I did not have a great experience, I guess. Um, when I went to Stanford, I was severely bullied, and I didn't, like, I couldn't keep up with the curriculum. It was really fast-paced, and I had a lot of stuff going on in my life. So it's kind of hard to, like, juggle everything all at once. And, you know, um, I understand, like, the Stanford and Hoover huge schools, you've got thousands and thousands of kids. So not every teacher gets the opportunity to meet with that student one-on-one -on -one to like, you know, help them understand something that they don't, you know, better or just kind of to help them through their day. But I went to New Beginnings because, um, or actually I found out about it because I went to my counselor every single day I was at the, at the base school. And um, Ms. Kane at whom Spain Park High School told me about New Beginnings. I had never heard of it. Um, I didn't even know about Crossroads, but the second I came, uh, I had all the teachers there, and they were so kind to me, like, they were nice, they would always smile at you, and they would always ask you how your day was, and genuinely care about how it was, and they were slower, and I could actually, like, learn and understand what I was doing, and when I was a freshman, I actually did not see myself graduating. I almost dropped out. Uh, I told my counselor that either I could drop out, or I was going to kill myself. Because I could not do it. I was not prepared for anything. Honest to God, freshman year, I found myself, by this time, either homeless or working a you know, little job and making like minimum wage, and I'm only 17. But it was that bad. And now, I'm almost done with my junior year. I have applied to colleges. I actually want to go to college. I'm super psyched about it. <laughs> I'm gonna be a senior in high school and I really am like planning on graduating, which is huge, because I did not ever think I was gonna get this far. But, uh, sorry. <laughs> the people I've met at Crossroads, like have, when I tell you that they've changed my life, they change everything about everything. Like they changed my perspective on school. I used to dread school. I hated getting up every morning. I hated having to see the people every day, but now I've I love it. I love getting up every morning. I love talking to my teachers. I love learning new things. I'm actually interested in it. I love English and math. Those are like two of my favorite subjects. And the teachers there helped me find out like what my actual passions were. And they've helped me find out what colleges, colleges I wanted to go to and what I want to do with my life. And now I'm actually going to be a citizen. <laughs> I'm actually doing things and I'm really happy. That I get to that I've made it this far because I've had, you know, a rough few years. But Crossroads means everything to me. New Beginnings is definitely my safe place, and they have saved me over and over again, and they will continue to. And those teachers, when I tell you, they care so much about their students. They would do anything. They would bend over backwards. They would give you the world. The counselors. <laughs> They let you vent and scream when you need to. They let you cry when you need to. They sit there and they really do understand what you're going through. And you don't get that everywhere. But I'm here to fight because I never thought I'd see the day where they were gonna give up New Beginnings. And I think every person there deserves to be there. And every person there deserves a New Beginning. And I'm gonna do whatever it takes. struggle through school for so long and I go to crossroads and it's changed everything. I used to hate getting up every day for school and I had a zero period and another class at Hoover. So there was so much stress and so when I came to New Beginnings that changed and I was able to actually focus on my work and see people who cared about what was happening. And my brother honestly can barely read on a fourth grade level and he's in eighth grade. 
And if he goes to Hoover next year, he's not going to be able to graduate. He is not going to be able to pass his grades because he can't function in a school like that. And I can't see him get bullied and teased because of what he can't have control over. Um, he got teased a lot in elementary school, and when I was there, I would try and defend him. But in a school that is as big as Hoover, I'm not going to be able to see him and help him throughout everything. And I don't want that to happen to somebody who can't do anything about it. Um, I've lived in Hoover my entire life, and I've been to Green Valley and Simmons, and I've never met teachers who honestly cared as much as these giving teachers do. Um, I met Miss Stevens like four months ago, and she's the nicest, sweetest lady I've ever met in my entire life. And she genuinely cares about what's happening <coughs> in the beginnings. If you look like you're having a bad day, she will come up to you and make sure you're okay. And I want that for the kids who can't deal with their schools. I know that a lot of people at Crossroads are there for grades, but there are a lot of people who are there for anxiety and social issues that they can't deal with. And I don't want to see them suffer. Stevens mentioned uh, that she was here to fight for New Beginnings and Crossroads uh, and not to give up on New Beginnings and Crossroads. Is, apparently, I must have missed something. I didn't know that, that New Beginnings and Crossroads were going away. Neither Crossroads nor New Beginnings will be going away. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm uh, Chris Monty, and I'm here to... Uh, just briefly convey uh, what I sense are some frustrations uh, that not only are my own, but um, are echoed by uh, some of my peer parents uh, in the Hoover City School System uh, with the state and status of the current rezoning process and, and the timeline that we're on and the uncertainty that exists right now in the community as to whether this is going to happen or whether uh, it won't happen. Um, there are a lot of folks, uh, for better or for worse, that took note of Mr. Sweeney's comments in one of the very early conferences with the judge and the plaintiff's attorneys regarding the ideal timeline that implementing a new student assignment plan should occur on. And the broad schedule that was discussed at that point involved having to know where the new school boundaries were being drawn by January or February at the latest and that six months was likely the minimum amount of time that was going to be necessary to implement such a complex shift. Um, obviously somewhere between uh, that discussion and today the time frame that is possible has been compressed down to uh, what is now about 90 days and it's gotten very ambitious and very aggressive and in the face of not knowing when Judge Heikkila is going to render her decision and what may indeed transpire, there are some impacts that have occurred just in the last few weeks uh, within the school system that I think represent the crossing of a boundary. Specifically, up until now, all of these discussions have really occurred between adults. Um, and in the past couple of weeks, there have been some events that have happened that have brought that uncertainty of this situation uh, into the realm of our children. And I feel like that boundary being crossed uh, represents a moment where the stakes have gotten a lot higher. And I feel like we're in the process of playing a big old game of chicken. And the consequences are really going to come home to roost uh, with our children. For example, we've had to have a transition night, um, an understandable gesture so that uh, students and parents could go explore what now might be their new school. In an ideal situation, they would be attending that event with some certainty as to whether or not it was their new school. Um, We've had kindergarten kickoffs now, um, in which I think parents are now obligated to explain to a five and six year old, uh, this is where you're gonna be going to school next year, maybe. Um, 
there's frustration with some parents about how individual education plans are going to be formulated for next year, not knowing if they should coordinate with faculty and staff at the school that they're currently attending or faculty and staff at the school that they're possibly attending. And whether or not those faculty and staff are going to be available in a couple weeks' time when everybody takes off for the summer. Uh, there's questions about fundraising and parents not understanding whether they should support the school they're at or the school that uh, they might attend. And rolled up into all of that is everything that, um, that you all are well aware of needs to happen just to make this transition occur from a practical standpoint. We still have a significant number of capital improvements to undertake um, to basic functions and services just to prepare these schools to receive their new student populations. Um, we don't understand what the faculty reassignment plan is and it's my understanding that Alabama state law allows a teacher to challenge any transfer to a new school via arbitration. So I question how we're going to have certainty even if Judge Heikkila comes back to us tomorrow uh, with knowing that uh, we're not just going to have a, a pretty big mess on our hands come August 11th and that all of these things that are necessary for our children to attend a viable functioning school are, are going to be in place. And I would simply close by saying that I understand that uh, in every interaction with Judge Heikkila, it has been stressed upon her the time-sensitive nature uh, of this decision. But from my personal standpoint, uh, don't do that. Um, I don't really lay any of this at her feet. Uh, in fact, I, I feel like walking into a federal court is a bit like taking your child to the doctor. You may have a 2 o'clock appointment, but every parent knows that when you get into that office, you're on the doctor's schedule. And they're going to see you when they're ready to see you, and they're going to give you a diagnosis when they're ready to give you a diagnosis. And I feel as though there has been a, a rush to get this plan in front of Judge Heikkila to insist upon implementing it for this coming school year. Um, and I, frankly, I want her to take her time. Uh, I want her to review this thoroughly, and I think we all should. So. Um, I'm hopeful that um, because of the vagaries of the agenda that a little bit later I'll hear some of the answers that I would like to hear and understand with a bit more certainty uh, what is going to transpire and what timetable we're going to be on and how long uh, we're going to wait. But I would, I would close by urging this body that in the absence of that certainty, in the absence of a decision from Judge Heikkila, Please take this matter into your own hands and let's have some definitive action that allows those in the community to know one way or another what is going to happen this coming school year. Thank you. Any additional public participation at this point? Now we will move on to our action items. Uh, have before you the minutes from the April 18th and April 26th uh, call board meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Minutes have been approved. Next on the agenda, uh, personnel report. Any questions from the board? There's no questions from the board. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Action, personnel actions have been approved. Mr. Murphy. Yes. Um, been asked for a point of privilege, Andy Urban. Yeah, there you are, Andy. I lost you. Andy, I'm the athletic director at Hoover. Uh, one of the personnel actions tonight with our new head basketball coach, uh, Crystal Johnson. Crystal went to Hoover and graduated from Hoover.
um, Coach Urban for giving me this opportunity to come back to my community and do the school what the school has done for me. I see a lot of my former teachers in here tonight and Hoover has been a huge part of my life and has made me the woman I am today and I'm just excited to be back and give back to these young ladies what has been given to me all these years. Thank you. Next on the agenda, business action items. Any questions from the board? Any questions for Ms. Lent? No questions. Do I have a motion to approve? No matter. Do I have a second? Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Business action items have been approved. Next on the agenda is uh, free roofing bid for Buff Park Elementary School and Shades Mountain Elementary School. Any questions for Dr. Murphy? All right, Murphy, can you just explain this a little bit, please? Um, yes, we have uh, <coughs> two bids that came in to us. Um, we have, uh, we're recommending to the board that you approve standard roofing of Montgomery even though they do not have the lowest bid, uh, that proposal is in place because of the failure of the other individual company that bid it, uh, did not provide us all of the um, uh, critical information that was required for bidding process. And Ms. Anke, would you add to that in any way? Okay. Uh, can I ask Tracy a question? Yeah. Ms. Johnson, is this scheduled to be done this summer? Yes, sir. Will it be completed by the start of school? Yes, sir. Both schools? Yes, sir. Thank you. Any additional questions? If there are no additional questions, do I have a motion to approve the bid for partial re roofing of Shades Mountain and Bluff Park Elementary School? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Action item has been approved. Next on the agenda, resolution for reconstruction of the structuring, I'm sorry, of an extended aid program. Uh, yes, board members, you have a number of documents that uh, provide you some rationale as it relates to the changes that we're proposing to our extended day uh, program. Uh, with some information timelines. I uh, hope that you've had an opportunity to take a look at that. And so I would like to ask that you approve a, a resolution that allows us to adopt a, and to approve the restructuring of the way we do our extended day program. The modifications to the terms of, of some of our employees will certainly be a conversation that we have already had. We'll be happy to talk to you about that. We have program facilitators and assistant facilitators that's also described in our plan. And we have had conversations with those employees, how this plan will impact them. Um, and I'd like for you, if you would, please to authorize us to, to take such action as may be necessary and appropriate for us to implement this restructuring plan. This plan basically will be moving us from or eliminating, if you will, full day camps over the course of summers. So if school is not meeting, those opportunities will be eliminated. Uh, holidays, summers will be eliminated. This will become an after school care program, not an extended <coughs> day program. So that eliminates holidays as an example and summer programs uh, but we'd be happy to answer questions we met with those employees um, both Ms. Uh, Green and I to have discussions with them and we'll certainly be glad to answer any questions that you might have at this point related to that program the the cuts that are made I guess of the restructuring of it and things are taken off from this extended program what, what calls are we talking about what cost are we talking about? Monetary from uh, 
So we're, so we're moving that. our employees, our facilitators from 12 month to nine month. And the thing that we realized is that uh, in terms of the finances for the school district, it cost us money to run the extended day program during the summer and during holidays. We have had a dwindle of the number of students who are interested in or who are attending that. And we've uh, ended up being, it's costing the school district money to run those particular programs other than those programs that are, are after school care. So no changes to the after school care, just everything. We continue to provide the after school care, just not the summer and holiday. Camps. Will that start next summer or this summer? This summer. That will start this summer and parents were notified. Long During a ago. couple of weeks this summer. Right. I'm sorry. So, so we met with. Um, mm -hmm. Give them the history of when we met with those individuals in January or February. Then we met with them again in March. Do you mm -hmm. mind just sharing with the board what conversations you've already had with those? Sure. Thank you. First of all, our facilitators, assistant facilitators, some of the most wonderful people we could work with, and our children are very fortunate to have them. Um, we began talking back in the fall about the possibility of uh, discontinuing the full day program because enrollment was just so low. We have 23 facilitators full time, and we often had fewer than 100 students in those camps. So you can imagine the ratio was excellent. Everybody had a great time, but it was extremely um, cost prohibitive. In addition, we have students who uh, require nursing care and that has to be contracted out. So it became increasingly uh, more obvious that that instead of providing what we needed to for, in other ways, that, that that part of the program was draining it. We uh, met with facilitators. I met with them February 16th on our professional development day. We talked at that point about the possibilities. We had an official meeting in March, I believe it's 22nd, where I outlined exactly how such a change would impact their lives um, right down to the, the days they would work and the hours they would work and, and how that would work for them. Um, Ms. Ante came up with a, a great plan to bridge the gap and she and Dr. Dobson and I decided that it would be uh, both to the facilitator's advantage and, and to our advantage for them to help us transition this summer when they weren't working that program so that they would not um, feel the financial impact of this change on such, not really short notice, but as much as we could to, to serve both needs. So uh, our facilitators have been well aware of the possibility and, and we've kind of had an ongoing conversation. Close to the first of February, it went out on uh, the iCare. We have a system that, that's like school messenger or extended day, and those parents were given that information and we put it on flyers and posted in the school that there would be no summer program. So we put it out early. So, board, I'd like to ask your approval of the resolution 2016 uh, 3, which is to allow us an opportunity to restructure our extended day program. Can, can I yes. ask one question? Yes. Two questions. This, at one point, I'm sorry, uh, Tricia Crane, resident of Hoover. Um, at one point, we talked about summer school, bringing the summer school program back for the elementary kids like we had many years ago, and we, and I'm also wondering how does that affect the extended school year for kids with special needs? Is that still offered? Yes. Ex extended school year is completely different. Okay. That is offered through IEPs, and it's determined on an individual basis. So it would still be in place it's for those still, kids who? It's okay. still in place. The extended day program is not in place, but extended school year is is done on an individual basis uh, through IEP, so that continues. And any word on the summer school program for the elementary kids? We talked about remedial. I know it costs money. Okay, I'm just, at, at some point there was some discussion. There, there is a program Dr. Smith's been working on that would, that would be available for some of our Title I students this summer that we hope to build a foundation of something going forward. It is, it is a very expensive program. 
So it's something that we hope we can build, work our way back to. And we also have some things for um, ESL students through Title III that will be occurring this summer at individual schools. Yes. Have, have you guys looked at block grant funding to pay for your senior day program? I know that's been done in other states. Have you guys investigated that with maybe the school, with the uh, city council? Uh, what we can do is, I know we're going all over the place. Let's try to get to the night so everyone can hear uh, what is going to say. Okay, so my question was that in other states, they use block grant funding to pay for extended day programs. A lot of it is like Title I funding. Have you explored that with the city council to see if that's a possibility? I, I have not talked to the city council about block funding. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from the board? No more additional questions. Do I have a motion to approve the resolution? Is read. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Resolution has been has been approved. Next on the agenda, policy manual updates. <coughs> Dr. Murphy. Uh, District Board members, we provided for your review last month the uh, updates to our policy manual. That was driven by the updates that we've received from the Alabama Association of School Boards through their policy pipeline. Uh, we have taken the time to share that with our Uniserve director and uh, bring that back to you this evening to ask your approval of those policies. Again, nothing outside of what our policy pipeline from the School Board Association proposes for us. We've actually borrowed, used that language that, that the uh, School Board Association has proposed to us. That language has been vetted by the attorneys with the School Board Association. So it's being presented to you as it's been presented up to us from the School Board Association. Questions. Murphy, I'd like to thank you for doing this. I know it's been several years since this has been done. There's been several updates issued by ASB, uh, so I appreciate you guys spearheading this and getting this updated for us. Thank you. Lots of people have put their hands on it. Brian uh, Phillips leaning in the back uh, really grabbed this and, and started in earnest with it. Melody Green <laughs> continued that process, so I'm grateful to my staff who just makes things happen. So thank you guys. All right. No more questions from the board. We have a motion, a motion to approve uh, the policy manual. So I'm going to have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion has been approved. Next on the agenda, textbook to be adopted. Dr. Murphy. Yes, we have a textbook adoption for our science and for some of our other areas. You will open that up so I can tell you exactly what. Ron, do you want to share anything with us? Uh, this is our year to select our science textbooks, and if you'll also take note, uh, Spanish literature, music, uh, theory, Chinese, Algebra One, and the IB mathematics piece. Yes, we always have some miscellaneous ones we have to get in each year, but um, we've already adopted the elementary materials. Those were adopted last month. These are the secondary materials. Ms. Dunn's been working on that. And uh, we ran numbers today to determine what percentage of the secondary adoption will be online resources. And Tammy, I think you said 91%. Yeah. Um, so we think that demonstrates our commitment to uh, better use of those resources. Dr. Doss, yes, Ms. Brown, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, if you're dealing with the approval of the books, what about the purchasing of the price? But, I mean, how do these bottle down on bids? Are they shopped? Um, the, the publisher are offered the opportunity to bid through the state, uh, through the state adoption. They, they enter contracts that the state offers to schools. Obviously, there's benefits to going through that option because of guarantees that go along with that. We're not required to um, just stick to the state list, but, um, but we try to go there as much as we can because of the guarantees that go with it. Um, but in all cases, we've gotten very, very good prices. Um, typically, the only books that we've had to um, We've had to go paper our college books uh, for some of the AP classes and for some of the specialized languages and IB, that kind of thing. Um, you're aware that Amazon is actually winning some contract with school districts now by the same competitive environment. Have you researched that to know that that might be interesting? Yeah. Been following it. It's not available in Alabama yet. 
but we have been following that. And typically, they have um, so far been offering it in connection with their technology. So um, all of these companies are, of course, wanting their products to go out, you know, using their devices. And of course, we want we want our kids to have more than just an e-reader. We want them to have a device that can do a lot more. So we're looking for those. Um, we try to call device agnostic packages so that we don't have to stick with a particular form of technology going forward. Now on the state list, you've got you've got what's it, a menu bed list, is that what it is, what the state's bid for the project? But yes, it can go out <coughs> outside of that if you We want. can. If the state rejects a title for some reason, that we cannot um, we cannot adopt a book that has been um, rejected by the state. But as long as they've not rejected it, we can adopt locally. And typically in those cases we execute a local contract um, with that publisher. That um, the only bad thing about those are they're typically the price is not guaranteed more than one or two years. Thank you. Any additional questions? No further questions. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion has been approved. Information and reports. Uh, yes, we have our audit report, and I'm going to refer to Kathy Ann. Yes, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce um, Jason Hart and Andrew Waits with um, Carvings and Ingram, and they're our external auditors, and they're here to give you a brief um, review of our audited financial statements for 2015. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> and as she said, my name is Jason Harp. I have Andrew Waits with me. I'm not sure that you may have your audited financial statements in front of you, but I can just sort of talk through the, the items I'd like to, to discuss tonight. The first thing, as you know, in a financial statement audit, really what you've hired us to do is to give an opinion on the financial statements. And our opinion is that it's, it will be an unqualified or unmodified audit opinion, which is certainly the highest opinion that you can have and the one that you want. If you read that audit opinion, it does a very good job of laying out what goes on in a financial statement audit. It discusses the procedures that we use, the testing, the recalculating, the confirming, those type items. It discusses our judgment of financial statement audit. It does a good job of concisely telling you what we do. You know, when we were here in November, we also discussed a big accounting change that has occurred during the year all throughout the country, and that was the booking of net pension liabilities on the full accrual, and forgive me if I get into accounting, but full accrual financial statements. You know, governments are unusual where you've got two sets of, of accounting methods that you use. You use full accrual, which is similar to a regular company, Coca-Cola or General Electric, and you use modified accrual, which is where we talk a lot with governments, fund accounting. We talk about the general fund a lot. But on your full accrual balance sheet that has all of your long-term assets and long-term debt, you've booked this year about $121 million net pension liability, which is a huge amount to book. And we kind of talked about in November, you know, the reasoning behind doing that. Previously, it was a footnote that was disclosed. And really what that represents is the, the actuarial shortage in your assets versus your promise to pay your your pension liability in the future and that difference is booked as this liability now one thing that's unique with schools in alabama is a lot of that money is obviously funded through the state so a lot of that liability will be paid in time through state funding and really it's those local teacher units that you're probably truly on the, the hook for with funding that retirement which i think is about 220 teacher units so that's something that, that's new this year, and it, and it caused, and it's caused this nationwide, your, your full accrual balance sheet to actually go into a deficit equity position because of this big liability that got put on. But there again, everybody's experiencing that at the same time, so it's something nationwide that's going to occur. If that wasn't enough, in 2018, there's going to be a new accounting rule that comes into the place where you'll do the same thing for your other post-employment benefits. So like health care benefits that you promised retirees, that amount will also get booked as a long-term liability. So there's this trend of showing these unfunded liabilities on your full balance sheet you know, to make it more transparent on this is the promise that we've made and what we've got to fund in the future. So that's one thing kind of that's happened now and things that are coming coming down the road. 
but at 9.30.15, kind of going forward to your fund financial statements where we where we live a lot, you added about $7 million, a little over that, to your general fund fund balance, which is certainly a positive and gives you more, certainly, than your 30-day uh, requirement as far as reserves go. So that's, that's a, a positive. And also, in your footnotes, if you're inclined to go there, there's a good section back to this pension funding on what happens if, if the discount rate that's used to calculate that net pension liability changes. It's 8% currently which is really the long-term discount rate used by the retirement systems of Alabama, which is pretty accurate over about a 35-year period. That's kind of what they return. But if that goes up one percentage point or down one percentage point, it can have a huge impact on that calculation of that net pension liability. So as you can imagine, over a long period, just one percent can have a huge impact. So, you know, it's important to make sure that we have that discount rate at what we think hopefully will be even higher than that, which will cause that to go down. But anyway, in a nutshell, it's kind of where we are with the, with the audit this year. Uh, we had no significant findings. Um, everything was, was good as far as in, internal controls go. We always evaluate that as part of part of our financial statement audit. It's not something we necessarily do, you know, required to do intensive test work over, but we do evaluate internal controls and we do test that. Uh, as we as we see fit, and if we find any weaknesses, we're re required to communicate that to you. But none came to our attention that require communicating. So, anyway, in a nutshell, that's where we stand with the audit. And I certainly will take any questions if you if you have any that you'd like to ask. What's our pension fund fund back by <coughs> state back RSA back by the general fund of the state of Alabama? What's ours back? Well, it'd be tax. You know, I guess it's the people that are funding their pension plans. You know, with with salary withhold withholdings is what's going into that to fund it so so that's how it's funded at the rsa so those benefits roughly that's about 38 percent or so of a salary included in that is the benefits they're paying to fund you know the pension plan and now i'm sorry and I'm, i should have said local i understand local honors, same same situation it would be whatever you're paying those teachers out of your local money there's a component of that that you're paying down to the RSA. Okay, you answered the question right there. So RSA is the state of Broncos managing our money like that. Thank you. Now, what's unusual with schools, and it's a little different than cities, and this is what had worried me about schools versus cities, is schools have what's called a cost-sharing pension plan, where it's just one big pool and all teachers are in that. Cities are a, a, a multi-agent plan where you can actually see their piece of the pie. So for years, the city of Hoover or Vestavia or, or you know, Karen or wherever, you know, you could actually see what their unfunded liability was looking in their footnotes. Schools didn't work that way. So a little bit of this $121 million liability, we weren't sure what that was going to be until they allocated their overall liability. And they did that based on contributions. So they took Hoover's contributions divided by total contributions and got that ratio and that's how they're they're allocating your your li total liability. And has this report been placed on the It will be after we get to it. Okay. Any additional questions? Any additional reports? I, I will state that since since we had this change in the because one of the concerns about adding that extra liability onto the balance sheet is that it could adversely impact our credit rating with Standard & Poor's and Moody, which would then impact our ability to raise funds in the bond market in the future. And we did have an update of our, or a, a confirmation of our bond rating back the first of the year with Standard & Poor's, and they upheld our rating. So that was a very positive sign because they, and they knew, and they're well aware, and we even discussed with the um, representative from Standard & Poor's that we were adopting this GASB that would reflect that liability. So they've been very true to their word and their understanding that they've not penalized um, these, the school boards as they've had to bring this onto their balance sheet from a rating standpoint. So that's very significant. And generally they're looking at the, can you make their, the funding more necessarily than a balance sheet assessment? That may go into it, but I think from what I've heard and talked to them, they're more concerned, probably so, do you have the capacity to repay repay your debt versus this snapshot of a liability. <laughs> really, this has always been there. We're just monetizing it and accruing it now on the balance sheet, so. Any additional questions? Board? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, new business, uh, maybe a couple of statements. I 
know we have uh, a goal was for Dr. Murphy to reach out to all our principals and, and uh, look at our finance and do a really good job with that and meeting with them and see if they need to, uh, uh, that we can uh, be more wise we uh, utilize as far as uh, funding when we're looking at our deficit we have here. Uh, but uh, I want to say that uh, Councilman Smith did reach out to me and I ask, uh, from that point, when it gets to the point where uh, we uh, have done all we can do, per se, or at least evaluated who would like to, uh, in a sense, uh, so I would say sponsor a meeting. He has the uh, Finance Committee for the city and uh, begin that dialogue conversation. But again, I know that uh, the goal when we first started was to make sure we look at our finances and make sure we spend it in the best way possible. Is that a meeting to be set up before we have our budget developed? Uh, with the conversation we've had, anytime you're ready, we need <coughs> to uh, begin that conversation. Uh, again, he has the finance committee. And he wants, he, he wants, he wants to extend that publicly. Okay. We accept it publicly. Thank you. Thank we'll you look so. forward to having an opportunity to, to, to talk. Thank you so much. And, uh, one more statement. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Ben Fulton that uh, I've been going to uh, uh, know for uh, some time being on the board, and I would like to tell him thank you so much. He has, every one of our meetings have been recorded. I find myself going back to his YouTube page and writing some notes from it. Uh, so I want to say thank you so much. Uh, he uh, taught. Western Oak Winter in Jackson Oak High School. My grandmother and my grandmother say hello <laughs> as well. So thank you. No more new business. Superintendent report. Uh, yes, three things, board members. So one, uh, I'd like to just remind you of our graduation dates and time. May 23rd at 7 o'clock is our Crossroads graduation. On uh, May the 25th at 5 o'clock is Spain Park High School graduation. And May 26th at 7 o'clock is our Hoover High School graduation. So uh, if, you, if you would take note of those. I'd also like to share with you that we are working on our student code of conduct. I believe there is a link up for that. There will be after this meeting. There will be a link, board members, that will allow you to go out and take a look at the proposed student handbook code of conduct and uh, we will uh, have conversations with you then later should we have another meeting this month or um, <coughs> let's see June we obviously need to probably just have some conversation about our student handbook with you all so that will post this evening or tomorrow sometimes probably tomorrow and Dr. Murphy will have the option to comment on the side if you have questions um, it will have instructions how you can comment and there have already been some questions and I believe some attorney responses to yes. some of those questions are also posted for your review. So hopefully that will help you as you're looking at the code of conduct to uh, see what questions you have, what questions have already been proposed, and what responses have already been offered up on some of those questions. Um, then, board members, I want to talk just briefly about rezoning. Uh, as you all know, we have uh, had an opportunity to uh, talk to Judge Heikala and, and uh, she has shared with us some additional questions that she has posed to the school district. Uh, we received this on, I believe it was Wednesday the, the 4th. We immediately, my staff and I immediately convened in the conference room and started that afternoon beginning to review the questions and making sure the staff uh, who would need to support us in responding to those. Uh, some of her questions she asked be answered by Friday at 5 o'clock, and we met that deadline. And then she has other additional questions which she posed to us, and uh, Ron and others have been working diligently on those throughout today, and we'll have those responses ready to provide to the court. Uh, we hope by noon tomorrow, but certainly not later than the 5 o'clock time frame which she has proposed to us. Uh, so we are working to respond to the questions that have been uh, given to us by the court and uh, 
Mr. Sweeney, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I don't know if there's anything additional that you would like to add to that. But I would say that we're very respectful of the court. We're respectful of the time frame that's necessary uh, for the, our judge to do uh, her due diligence and review of our student assignment plan. So with that said, Mr. Sweeney, I don't know if you wish to add in any thoughts. What Mr. Monte shared with us uh, describes the challenges, describes the multiple steps that will have to be taken for a new student assignment plan to be put in place. He also states accurately that Judge Hakla is very sensitive to the time frame within which a decision can or cannot be successfully implemented. Uh, the plan that was presented to the court was approved by the Department of Justice and the Legal Defense Fund after they looked at not just the impact on desegregation, but the feasibility of implementing that plan based on extensive dialogue with you and your staff. And they were satisfied before it was presented to the court that the plan could be um, implemented successfully and, and appropriately. The plan um, that's before the court um, was the subject of the five community meetings, at which time every aspect of the plan that was presented was uh, vetted by the public, um, reacted to by the staff, diligently planned to look at all the concerns of uh, what might go wrong, how to make sure we have strategies in place to prevent that from happening. And um, when you came to this board uh, to make the recommendation to the board to approve the plan, you did so with the explicit and implicit message that um, any plan that you go forward with will be a plan that can be successfully implemented in the best interest of the students. If the court approves the plan that is presented to it and approved by the Department of Justice and um, LDF, um, and she makes a decision soon, we still believe that it's uh, very feasible to implement all of the action plans that you have in place to do all of the multiple, multiple steps that Mr. Monte outlined. If the, chain, if the court were to reject the plan, or if the court's decision was not soon, then you would have to assess what um, needs to be done to successfully serve the students of Hoover. And you're very conscious, conscious of that very aware of that, and your board knows that you will not make any decision to go forward or backwards that won't be successful for the students and the uh, people involved. So um, we, we won't know until we get the court's decision as to the scope of the decision or the timing of the decision, but I think um, the board um, has complete confidence in your judgment about what can be successfully implemented and complete confidence in you that if for some reason it can't be, you're not going to press forward in a manner that would be detrimental to the um, <coughs> academic mission of this system. Questions you have, board members? Does Dr. Murphy have a date after which any decision by Judge Heikkila makes implementing the rezoning plan for next year unfeasible? Is there a drop dead date? We have not given the judge a drop dead date. Well, you can. I mean, she has her own schedule. What I mean is, after, after, is there a date Dr. Murphy has in mind when all the <coughs> things that are necessary to implement the new student assignment plan no longer become feasible, even if Judge Heikkila approves the plan. If she approves the plan on August 10th, obviously not everybody's going to be going to their new school on August 11th. So what is the date after which it no longer becomes feasible to implement all of these transitional items in a timely fashion for next year? 
we are still within the window of time that I believe that that can happen and I'm not prepared to say the drop dead date is. Right. Next on the agenda, we have election of board officers. Uh, board members, uh, it is uh, time for us to elect a president and a vice president to serve for our board according to state law this is something that should occur at the very first regular meeting in may and that is this evening and so we need to proceed with the election of a president and the vice president as the chief executive officer and as your secretary it's incumbent <coughs> upon me to preside over this particular process of our work uh, mr murphy i'd like for us to designate louise white uh, to serve as our clerk for the election purposes if you would uh, and she's prepared to do that for us. As you all know, we'll proceed with Robert's Rules of Order, the modified version in terms of conducting our elections. Our nominations will be taken from you all for both offices, again, under the Robert's Rules of Order. And just as a reminder, no second is required for purposes of making a nomination. So we can take a nomination, no second is required. Um, and of course, to remind you, the same person may be nominated for more than one office if that, if that individual is not selected for the position for which he, he or she is first uh, nominated. Elections will be by a roll call vote with an aye for, uh, from a majority in order for that candidate to be elected. Are there any questions that you all might have that I could answer prior to us beginning the process? If not, uh, nominations are now in order for the president for our board. I'd like to nominate Derek Murphy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to nominate a gentleman that uh, has served as uh, vice president for, for some time. Uh, Stephen is a, uh, say, he doesn't make a comment unless he's researched it over and over and over and over again and challenges it, challenges it over and over again. That's, uh, that's uh, served us really greatly. Three kids in the system, one they recently graduated, and uh, one in Auburn now, and then out has a child at 10th grade, 10th grade. So he's very active in, in, in the school. So I would like to nominate Stephen Presley as president of the School of Board of Education. And just had a daughter graduate this weekend. Congratulations. Stephen Presley is nominated for president. Are there further nominations for president? has been nominated. Are there any other nominations for president? Hearing no further nominations, the chair declares nominations closed for president and congratulations, Mr. Presley. Um, in order to stay consistent with what I have, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Uh, Mr. Kelly? Aye. And Mrs. Beach? Aye. Okay, thank you so much. Again, our congratulations. <laughs> Nominations are now in order for our Vice President position. I'd like to nominate Mr. Earl Cooper for Vice President. Okay, Mr. Earl Cooper is nominated for Vice President. Are there further nominations for Vice President position? Hearing no further nominations, we'll do uh, a roll call vote again. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Presley? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. And Mrs. Beach? Aye. Okay, so congratulations to Earl Kelly, who will serve as our vice president. Excuse me, Cooper. <laughs> we just mix it all up there. Uh, congratulations to Mr. Cooper, who will serve as our vice president. Thank you. Uh, next scheduled board meeting is, is June 13th at 5.30 in Central Office. Uh, we will now convene to executive session. Uh, we anticipate 30, 30 or 40 minutes is for the purpose of a, a disciplinary hearing. At that point, once we uh, Convened to legal sessions, I will ask everyone in this room to exit for the disciplinary hearing. Uh, so 30 to 40 minutes. Do I have a motion for the legal session? Move. Second. 
I move. Do, yeah, I have a Do I have a second? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion has been carried. No further business, the meeting is adjourned. There are refreshments upstairs again, acknowledging Mr. Murphy and Ms. Green and Mrs. Auntie. Board members, you want to go up first? Yeah,